Hello everybody. In this video, I want to talk about judging and setting exposure using the Sony FX3. Now this will also apply to say the A7S III and likely most other Sony uh, mirrorless cameras as well. Uh, so what I've done is I've set up a table behind me and I've got a couple of lights. So I've got a main key light, which is my Aperture 300X. And, and then also got a 60X, which is projected onto the wall behind. So I can show you in an ideal lighting situation where you've got a nice evenly lit room. I can show you how I go about exposing using a couple of profiles. I'll show you Rec. 709 and also using S-Log3. But I'll also adjust the backlight to show a common scenarios where maybe you've got you know, a bright window behind your subject and how, how do you expose in that instance? And how does using the tools vary if you're facing that problem? And also maybe if you've got you know, a bright light on your subject with a dark background. How do you have to think differently then? But for now, as I say, I really just want to go over the tools in the camera and how they really help you with judging exposure and setting correct exposure depending on the results that you want to get. For these examples, I'm going to be using this X-Rite Color Checker Passport because it gives me the ability to measure both middle grey as well as a range of skin tones. I'd highly recommend one of these. However, you can also just use a simple gray card for setting exposure. And I'll post a link to some of the options that I use in the description below. Throughout these examples, I'm gonna be sticking to the lower of the two base ISOs for each picture profile that I'm using. In this first example, I'm gonna be using picture profile three, which uses the ITU 709 gamma curve. So I've set my ISO to 80. I'll also be sticking to 25p with a 180 degree shutter of 1 50th throughout. And I'm just gonna be using the iris control to change exposure. First, let's talk about the camera's built-in multimeter. The multimeter reading is marked by the MM icon at the bottom of the display. You can see the meter telling me that this shot is 1.7 stops underexposed with the iris set at 3.2. Let's correct that by opening the iris until the meter reads zero. I'm going to use the function menu to quickly check the metering mode. I have changed the layout of my function menu, so you might see different options in yours. I have actually posted a video about how I configure my camera, including the function menu, which I'll post a link to in the description. Notice the selected icon for the metering mode. You can see that if I select it, I can then change the modes. Let's start with the first one, which is multi-pattern metering. This measures the light in multiple areas. You can see that this generally works well in an evenly lit scene like this. And even when I'm panning around a little, it stays fairly consistent. If I start increasing the backlight here, you can see that even though the color chart isn't changing in brightness, the meter is still showing the image to be overexposed by one stop. If I close the iris down to f2.5 to compensate for that, then whilst the meter says we're correctly exposed, the foreground is now actually underexposed a little. If this were somebody's face, then we may be able to work with that or correct it in post. But the important thing to take from this is that by using the multimeter, it's hard to have a good understanding of how well exposed specific elements are within the scene. I'll bring the backlight back down again and we'll have a look at the next metering option, which is center weighted. Center weighted still measures the entire screen, although it emphasizes the area in the center to meter exposure. And you can see as I pan to the right, that the meter is showing this scene to be one third of a stop over. If I bring up the backlight, you'll see that the reading changes accordingly to 1.7 stops over. If I pan back to the chart, you'll see that the meter adjusts, but it's still accounting for the brighter background and reporting the scene to be a third of a stop over. I'll adjust my iris to bring that back to zero. Next, we'll look at spot metering. In here, you can choose between standard or large. I'll just go with standard for now. With spot metering, only the area inside the spot is measured. As I pan the camera, you can see the meter reporting the levels in the brighter background. However, as it returns to the chart, the meter is still reporting the correct exposure. By default, the spot stays in the center of the screen. And if I move the focus area away, you can see that the spot remains in place. One really useful feature is that you can make the spot follow the focus area. To set this, go into the exposure menu, choose metering and then spot metering point and change that to focus point link. Now you can see that the spot meter follows the movable focus area, allowing you to meter different parts of the scene 
without actually moving the camera. The next mode is entire screen average. As it says on the tin, this looks at the entire screen and reports an average metering level. It's now reporting the scene to be a stop over, so I'll bring that down to zero. The advantage of this one is that it's less likely to report exposure changes as the scene changes. However, this still doesn't allow us to ensure correct exposure on our main subject. Finally, we have highlight metering. Notice that as soon as I select this, the meter reports we're 1.3 stops over. This is because it's metering only the brightest parts of the scene. And if we bring the exposure down to zero, our foreground is gonna look very underexposed as a result. The metering is not affected as I pan around because the brightest part remains in the scene. I'm gonna change back to multi-pattern metering as there's one more feature that's worth talking about when using this mode. If we jump back into the exposure metering menu, you'll see that there's an option called face priority in multi-metering. With this switched on, the camera will prioritize its metering based on any detected faces in the scene. It's important to understand how this works though, so I'll welcome back a previous guest on the channel to help out. As you can see, even though the camera has detected Gerald's face here and it's underexposed, the meter is still reporting that exposure is correct and hasn't adjusted for the presence of a face in the scene. That's because this feature only seems to affect the metering results when using an auto exposure mode. So for instance, if I enable auto iris, you'll see that the camera will then adjust exposure for the face. Notice how the iris has adjusted itself from 1.8 to 1.6. And if I move Gerald further into the shadow, the camera will continue trying to adjust. It's now gone to 1.2 and starting to flash because the scene is still underexposed and 1.2 is the maximum aperture for this lens. And now if I move Gerald out of the frame, you'll notice that the camera will then readjust its exposure back to 1.8. So it's worth remembering that if you do enable this option, whilst the camera can adjust to faces in the scene, it won't actually show you any metering differences when it detects a face. So whilst the multimeter can be a useful tool to help with exposure, it doesn't allow us to set a precise exposure level. And this is where the Zebra tool comes in. If I switch on the zebra display, you'll see that it's currently putting diagonal lines on certain parts of the image. These lines show any areas in the scene that are currently at the brightness level defined by the zebra settings. We're still in picture profile three, which is a Rec 709 profile that can store a brightness range from black at zero to the brightest whites at 108%. When I go into the zebra settings via the function menu, you'll see that there's a bunch of presets that you can scroll through ranging from 70% to 100% and 100% plus. You can choose any of these to display those levels on the screen. However, what I'm gonna do is concentrate on the two custom settings at the bottom, which is C1 and C2, or custom one and custom two. These are the only two options that I'll generally use and I'll adjust them to whatever I need depending on the picture profile I'm using. So let's start with C1. If I press right on the control wheel, we can choose between standard plus range or lower limit. We'll stick with standard plus range for now and I'm going to set 44%, which is where middle gray should fall if using a standard Rec 709 picture profile. The range setting allows us to choose how many of the brightness levels each side of our standard setting we also want to include in the zebras. For now, I'm just gonna leave that at plus minus one for the most precise measurement. As you can see, our middle gray is already showing zebras at 44%. So at the moment, our chart is exposed correctly. If you're not in an environment where you can practically use a gray card though, then the next best thing I find is to use skin tones to set your exposure. This is gonna be a little bit less precise than using a gray card, mainly because skin tones come in many shades and also the way the light falls on skin can vary a lot. However, you can still achieve a good exposure using skin tone. For a Rec 709 profile like the one we're using here, I like to keep all of my skin tones below 70%. So let's change our standard setting on C1 to 70%. You can see straight away that with our correctly exposed shot, the second skin tone swatch on the color checker is at precisely 70%. I'll adjust the iris slowly until the zebras disappear from the skin tones 
in my opinion, it's always better to be a touch under with skin tones rather than over, uh, especially when shooting with a Rec. 709 profile. And once again, as you can see, this gives us a nicely exposed image using our Rec. 709 picture profile. The other thing we can use zebras for is identifying any areas in our shot that are overexposed to the point of being blown out. To show that, I'll increase the backlight in the shot. And as you can see, a lot of the background is now blown out. To help us see those areas, let's go back into the zebra settings, and this time we'll use the second custom setting of C2. For this one, we'll change the type to lower limit, which displays zebras over any area which is brighter than the setting that we choose. So now there's a lot of zebras showing because obviously there's a lot of our image which is above 70%. So let's increase the lower limit to 108 plus, which is the maximum brightness for this picture profile. Now you can clearly see the parts of our image that are blown out and completely white. Let's go and double check to make sure that our foreground is still correctly exposed and check the middle gray. So as you can see, we're a little off now. You can also see that the spot metering is still doing a good job of showing that we're a little under. So I'll just adjust the iris to bring the middle gray back to where it should be. And as I bring these zebras back onto the middle gray, the meter is also reporting zero on our chart. And now we can easily check the highlights by toggling back to C2. In a situation like this, you'd have a choice. Depending on the subject, you could choose to let the background blow out, or you could lower the exposure and try to retain more of the highlight details and try to fix the foreground in post. Let's try that now. I'm gonna bring my exposure down until none of the background is blowing out. This brings our foreground down around two stops under, as we can see from the spot meter. So here's what the underexposed image looks like in post. And using some grading, I've just brought it back a little, but that is time consuming. So unless you're planning to do a lot of selective masks in post to retain the highlight detail at the same time as exposing the foreground, it's likely just better to expose your foreground correctly to begin with. The next tool we have for managing our exposure is the histogram. You can show this by pressing the display button to cycle through the various displays until the histogram appears. The way I like to think of the histogram is like a bar chart that displays how much information is being stored at each of the brightness level, ranging from 0% black on the left all the way through to the blown out whites on the right. In this example, you can see that with our middle gray exposed correctly at 44%, the whole scene fits nicely inside the histogram. If, however, I raise the backlight a little, Watch what happens on the histogram now. As the image becomes brighter, the levels on the right of the histogram start filling up with the brightest blown out parts, indicating by the bar growing on the far right side. Whilst the histogram isn't a great tool for correctly exposing specific parts of the image, it can be really useful for giving you a wider understanding of how the scene is being captured within the dynamic range that the camera is capable of recording with the currently selected picture profile. With the foreground now correctly exposed, I can adjust the backlight without having to change the zebras by simply watching the histogram until all of the image is contained within the available dynamic range with nothing in that last bar on the right. As you can see, this gives us a nicely exposed image with everything captured within the dynamic range of the picture profile we're working in. Next, I'm gonna increase the brightness of the backlight again and we'll switch back to the C2 zebras to show our blown out whites. Here you can see an example of how all three of these metering tools can be used at the same time. We've got the spot multimeter monitoring our foreground, the zebras are showing us blown out areas in the background, and the histogram is giving us an overall picture of how the scene fits within the dynamic range available in this picture profile. So we still have this problem of not having enough dynamic range to stop the highlights blowing out while still exposing the foreground correctly. This is a good example of where using a log gamma will help. So I'll switch to picture profile eight, which uses S-Log3. Now that we're using S-Log3, I'll raise the ISO to 640 because that's the lower base ISO for S-Log3. You can actually see that the camera is warning us about this by displaying the lines above and below the ISO value. So with S-Log3, the recommended middle gray exposure is 41%. So I'll change the C1 zebra to 41. And you can see straight away that the middle gray is already showing zebras here. So we're at a good exposure for the foreground. 
Notice the additional dynamic range we have in the histogram now that we're using S-Log3. With the foreground correctly exposed, there's now plenty of room for all of the shadows as well as the highlights. This is with the same background brightness that we couldn't capture in Rec. 709. So I'm going to overexpose the image now and notice that the histogram does not show data as far to the right as it does with the Rec. 709 profile and it starts to fill up at an earlier level. This is because S-Log3 has a lower maximum brightness value of 94 compared to Rec. 709 where it went all the way up to 108. This is also the reason why we're not seeing any zebras showing the blown out parts of the image because they're currently set to display at 108 plus. To correct that, I'm going to go into the C2 zebra settings and change the lower limit value to 94 plus. With that done, you can now see zebras on the blown out areas. I'll bring the exposure back down now and you can see both with the zebras and the histogram that our highlights are no longer clipping. I'll switch the C1 zebras back to 41% just to make sure we're spot on with the exposure. Notice now that even though we've exposed middle gray correctly, the spot multimeter isn't reporting zero. This is because the multimeter isn't quite as reliable when using S-Log. If I change the multimeter back to multi-pattern mode, you'll see that even though our middle gray is correct, the multimeter reports that the image is 1.7 stops over, as it's also taking into account the brighter parts of the image in the background. This is a good example of why zebras and the histogram become more important when shooting in log. For exposing skin tones in S-Log3, I set my zebras to 52%. And then as with Rec. 709, I adjust my exposure so that the zebras are either just below or just starting to show on skin. Here's how the resulting image looks out of camera. And then with an S-Log3 to Rec. 709 LUT applied. And here's the Rec. 709 image from earlier for comparison. So next up, we'll do something slightly different. This example is using a key light with a dark background. I'm still using S-Log3 here and I'm going to expose using skin tone with my C1 zebra set to 52%. I'll back off the exposure until the zebras disappear from the skin tones and notice how the histogram is showing most of the data is in the darker side of the range. So here's the resulting S-Log3 clip and here's what it looks like with an S-Log3 to Rec. 709 LUT applied. So next I'm going to shoot the same image but this time I'm going to shoot it for use with the leaming LUT. To expose correctly for the leaming LUT, you need to use ETTR or expose to the right using the histogram. So to do this, I'm going to use the histogram to expose until the data starts climbing on the right side. And then I'm going to back off a little so that none of the highlights are blowing out. Here you can see that the line is starting to rise on the right of the histogram. So I'm going to back off until that line is empty. Just out of interest, I'm also going to use my C1 Zebra to see where that puts the skin tones. You can see that the brightest skin tones are now reaching 85%, which is really quite high compared to the normal 52% recommended for S-Log3. When using the leaming LUT, it is recommended that skin tones can be set up to 85%. However, I do like to keep mine below 80, so I'm going to change my C1 zebras to 80% and bring my exposure down so that the skin tones fall below that. So here's how that clip looks out of camera. It looks really overexposed at this stage, but when the leaming LUT is applied, it brings everything back down to the correct looking levels. One of the benefits of overexposing a little like this gives you the ability to pull back some of the shadow detail that otherwise would have been hard to recover if exposed normally. If you're using the leaming LUT and you want to use middle gray to expose, then it's recommended to set that at 71%, which will give you similar results to the previous example that I showed. Finally, let's switch back to picture profile three and expose this same scene using Rec. 709. I'll change the ISO back to 80 and set my C1 Zebra to 44% and expose to put my Zebras on middle grey. Note how the multimeter is now more accurate again and also that the histogram is showing that the Rec. 709's dynamic range can fully capture this scene. 
using a correctly exposed Rec. 709 or Cine profile is by far the easiest solution for post-production. However, notice here that when I bring the shadows up, we no longer have any of that additional shadow detail that we captured when we overexposed a little in the previous example. So there we go, I hope that was useful. Check out this playlist if you're looking for more Sony FX3 content. And if you have any questions, then please do just leave a comment below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you have time, it would be great if you subscribe to the channel and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.